My advice as far as like when it comes to whatever it is you want to write or material you want to find or a story you want to tell or you want to do is what's a movie you want to see? If you just truly love cinema with enough passion and you really love it, then you can't help but make a good movie. What's the movie that we have never seen because you haven't made it? And make that movie. I have, I've gone, I, I, I do it differently than I've done it before. Uh, I used to write all night. That was kind of my thing. Or I'd go, I mean, during the daytime, I'd write in restaurants or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just kind of being up all night was kind of part of it and, and stopping for a while and listening to music and that was all part of it. Then somewhere around in Glorious Bastards, I uh, started writing during the day and I would write on my, uh, I have a balcony outside of my um, bedroom uh, that has a place for a table and stuff and it looks mm -hmm. off to the, I live in the Hollywood Hills, so it looks off into the, the, the greenery there and it looks really nice. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's really pleasant out there. And I can play music and stuff, it's so cool. And so anyway, uh, uh, so like say I start, uh, I started writing, like say around, uh, you know, 10, 10, 30, 11, something like mm -hmm. that. And then I write till about, uh, you know, five, six or seven, something like that. Mm -hmm. But around, around that time, around five or six, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop for the day. And what I do is I, I, I stop for the day. And then after a little bit of time of unwinding, I go into my pool and I keep it all nice and warm there and everything and so I just kind of hang out in the pool and if I'm not done with something mm -hmm. I'm thinking okay um, what do I want to do what how I, how, how do I want to go further with this uh, uh, now that I've written the first pass on it what do I think about it how can I make it better is there another element I can bring into it did I mm -hmm. uh, do, uh, add too much to yeah and whatever I'm just uh, uh, looking at it critically and maybe I come up with some neat ideas mm -hmm. and then I get out of the pool and I make notes on those neat ideas that I came up with like thinking meditating about it mm -hmm. it actually is meditating um, and then that's my work tomorrow when I mm -hmm. get up all right or if I finished a scene okay mm -hmm. boom boom that's done now that part of the story is done now I go in the pool and I go okay what happens next what's the next thing mm -hmm. and then I usually come up with a, a pretty good idea and then I make my notes and then that's the next day's work and that was never really the way I did it and that has come exclusively the way I did in Glorious Bastards and Django mm -hmm. and this and it 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 truly brings a, a lot of joy to my life. It's a really, really lovely, lovely way to work that makes me feel really happy. I and mean, the thing is, I know as a viewer, the yeah. minute I start getting confused, I check out of the movie. Emotionally, I'm confused. severed. Confused. Yeah, if, if when I'm watching a movie and all of a sudden something starts happening where all of a sudden the storyline and everything is, it, I, I, it, it gets confusing, I don't know where I'm at yeah. when I'm watching it. My, you know, you, I think an audience has like this, you know, like almost like umbil umbilical cord to the, to the screen. And it gets severed when, when confusion comes and in. And therefore you lose them. Exactly. And the thing is, most of the time, when, you get confu when I get confused and that's severed, it's basically because I'm not supposed to be confused. Yeah. All right, that's like, it's, it's a mistake. All right. Um, however, if you get confused, there's no problem with being momentarily confused if you feel you're in good hands. Yeah. All right, and I don't think my movie, and, and, and disagree if you please, is that I don't think Pulp Fiction, for all of its goings in and around and, and up and down, they are and, yeah, and, and how it goes in this big circle, I don't think it's hard to watch at all. No, it's not. You have to watch it. I, I ask for you to watch it. You can't like put this on video and like do the New York Times crossword puzzle and watch the movie. <laughs> That's right. All right, all I ask, you put everything down yeah. and watch Give it. Give me two hours and whatever it is, 10 minutes. Exactly, and then once you do that, then you, know, you can follow it, it's, it's easy to follow. It was almost via Patty Chayesky that I actually realized that I actually uh, was, not a, was a pretty good writer and made me want to think about exploring this a little bit. Because how I actually kind of discovered writing dialogue is I used to be, uh, I'd be an actor and I'd be in acting classes. And, um, and so part of your thing in acting classes is to drum up scenes to do. And I always wanted to do scenes from movies and stuff. And then I didn't have access to any scripts or anything like that. So I would like go and watch a movie and then I could remember, I had a good memory, so I'd remember the scene. So I'd go home and write the scene down and whatever I didn't remember, I would just fill in the blanks myself. 
Well, little by little, I would just start filling in more blanks and more blanks and just kind of go off and do my own thing and add to the scenes. That was me first, my first attempt at writing dialogue with stuff like that. And I had forgotten I was doing a scene with from Marty, uh, Patty Chayefsky's Marty, in class. And I was later I was talking to uh, the guy I did the scene with, and he goes, uh, I, I mentioned what I just mentioned. He goes, Cat Quinn, you're you're as good as Patty Chayefsky. What are you talking? Well, remember when we did Marty and, and all of a sudden there's this monologue about the fountain? Y yeah. That's not in Marty. That's you. <laughs> I actually, you gave me your handwritten version. I actually have Marty at home. And I go, there's, 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 there's no fountain. There's no monologue about a fountain in this scene. But it fit in perfect with the scene. And it was like, well, it's just as good as the Patty Chayefsky stuff. And it literally, it was him. His name was Ron Coleman, Ronnie Coleman. And um, when he said that, it was like the first ding, little it was a little tiny dinner bell, you know, little, you know, like the one around the side of a table, ding, ding, ding. All right, it was the first little ring that was like, maybe I should pay attention to this. Maybe I should explore this a little bit more. And so I thought the idea, would, in the case of Pulp Fiction, that would be kind of cool, is to take three separate stories, and uh, and and make them be the oldest stories in the book, you know, whether it be. Uh, um, uh, Vincent's character, the ga the hoodlum, has to go out with the boss's lady, but don't touch her. And there's a whole history of people who have touched her and what happens. Well, we've seen that before, a zillion times. All right, um, and um, in the case of uh, the Bruce Willis story, that's that's the boxer supposed to throw the fight and he doesn't, and now the mob's after him. We've seen that story a million times before. And one of the things I thought about, like the third story, uh, was basically kind of the beginning of at the at the time of almost every Joel Silver movie, which would start off with like a couple of hitmen showing up, boom boom. All right, you want to witness something? Witness this. <laughs> <laughs> and they shoot the guy, and then it cuts to Arnold Schwarzenegger walking through the forest, and eventually he's going to meet those guys. And so I thought, well, what happens if we hung out with them all night long? All, all, all night long, all day long, all right, after they've killed the guy? What happens to the rest of their day? And so it was the idea of taking these, these chestnuts and putting them together, and then actually having the characters kind of intertwine, and it all kind of takes place in one, one city. And it's an environment that they all live in, and the characters kind of know each other, but you don't know that for a while. And it was just kind of like hanging out with them for those two days. Your heroes are always anti-heroes. They're oh. almost always villains. Yeah. I mean, your, your heroes <laughs> are always... So it's not dark exactly, because they're kind of weirdly light villains. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of their mm -hmm. happiness with villainy. But they're never, you know, I mean, again and again and again, you wouldn't call them classic heroes, I mean, in the sense of yeah. the heroic leading man, like Frederick Zoller, even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that something that you think about when you're writing? I, I actually really try to um, have morality not even be an issue at all, all right, when it comes to my characters. Yeah, but so interesting. I mean... You know, I don't want that to have any play whatsoever. I, that would be me commenting on them. Right. That is me sticking my big nose into their lives and then their philosophies. Right. I let them be who they are. And, you know, my just feeling is... You know, I, I just I just want the same rights that a novelist has. I mean, like, we lived through the 80s where, like, f***ing every Hollywood movie, everyone had to be likable and everybody had to be understandable. Right. And, uh, right. and the test scores were like, oh, well, we didn't like him, so we got to change every goddamn thing. You know, and um, I didn't make movies at that time, but I was watching them, and I said, I'm not going to make that crap. And, um, <laughs> and I just want the same freedom that a novelist has. I mean, you can make a novel, you can write a novel about a bastard, but it can be totally interesting. My advice as far as like when it comes to whatever it is you want to write or material you want to find or a story you want to tell or you want to do is what's a movie you want to see? What is a movie that some, you know, it's, like, you know, uh, 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 what is it you want to contribute? All right, uh, and, and, and make it maybe just even slightly a little less about you yourself. I'm assuming most of you guys haven't made a feature yet, all right? So, but there's a lot of features that have been made before you. There's a whole lot of movies you could see, a whole lot of movies you could watch without you. <laughs> What's the movie that we have never seen because you haven't made it? And make that movie. Make the movie that it's the reason why you're going to be doing it, all right? The truth of the matter is, good, bad, or indifferent, Reservoir Dogs didn't really exist before I did it. Heist films had been made, 
And, you know, I, and there's a whole story about this Hong Kong movie, City on Fire. If you've ever seen City on Fire, it's very, very different from my movie. The section that they say I took, I did take from it, all right? Absolutely, I took from it, mm -hmm. all right? But it's a very different movie. They actually talked to the director, Ringo Lam. He goes, wow, it's, well, uh, Tarantino took the last 10 minutes of my movie and made an entire movie about it. Well, that's a fucking different movie. That's very, very different. But the point being, though, is what I had to say and my kind of idea of crime films and my idea of dialogue, you know, there, there was Barry Levinson and Tin Men and there was Goodfellas and there was all kinds, there was the David Mamet stuff, all that stuff existed. That, that was sort of like Reservoir Dogs, but it wasn't Reservoir Dogs. It, it didn't have this aesthetic that, I, that I'd been having, you know, because the thing is, I wasn't being, you know, the, the movies that were collecting in my head, for all the movies I saw, I never saw them. I saw a flash of them. I saw a, a movie that would have a scene that would be the aesthetic that I was looking for or they would play a song in a movie and that would be the kind of song that I would use and it would have the kind of feeling that I'd want a song to have in one of my movies. Uh, or uh, a character would be the kind of character that I wanted to do a movie about. Not all the other characters, just one character. You know, but usually, like I said, it was a scene. It was uh, uh, a mood for only a little bit or a section of the movie. But it was never the whole enchilada. It was never th that aesthetic that was in my head it was never just there. I mean, if it was just there, if, if two or three other people were doing it, I might not have been a filmmaker because I didn't need to get it out of my head. And one of the director goes, Did, have you done your subtext work? I go, no, what's that? Ah, you see, you think because you wrote it, you know everything, but you don't know everything. You've done the writer work. You haven't done the director work. You need to do your subtext work. So he's describing this whole thing to me, and I was you know, still pretty young at the time, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, is that really what a director does? Wow, really? Tell me about it. And so they're telling the whole thing, and I was actually really kind of excited to go off and, and give this a shot. So I took, to me, what I thought was like the most obvious scene you could possibly take. I took Mr. White bringing Mr. Orange into the warehouse all by themselves. Mr. Orange, because he's a cop, is saying, please, and he's dying, <laughs> please, 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 take me to the hospital. Mr. White, because he doesn't know he's a cop, is like, no, 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 I can't take you to the hospital. You can just hang in there. So, I, I could ask anybody in this theater here, what does that scene mean if you've seen the movie? And you could tell me. But when you actually start putting pen to paper, it becomes a different thing. It actually, a lot of stuff opened up that I hadn't thought about before because subtext is getting beyond what's the obvious there. And so I wrote down, what does Mr. White want from this scene more than anything else in the world? What does Mr. Orange want from this scene more than anything else in this world? And what do I, as the filmmaker, want the audience to take away from this scene more than anything else in the world? And just even writing the obvious shit about Mr. Orange is dying and he wants to be taken to a hospital, all of a sudden, the more I wrote, the more I realized that the movie was a father-son story. And that Mr. White was functioning as Mr. Orange's father at that moment. And Mr. Orange was functioning as a son, but he was a son who'd betrayed his father. But his father doesn't know about the betrayal. And he's trying to hide it from him as long as he can because the guilt is really starting to hit him. Yet, Mr. White has faith in Joe Cabot, Lawrence Turney, who is his metaphorical father in this situation. And what does he keep saying? They're like, just don't worry about it. Wait for Joe to get here. When Joe gets here, you're all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. And what happens when Joe gets there? He kills Mr. Orange. And then actually Mr. White has to choose between his father, his spiritual father, his metaphorical father and his metaphorical son. And naturally he chooses his metaphorical son and he's wrong. But he's wrong for all the right reasons. That was pretty heavy. That's fascinating. <laughs> and <laughs> that was pretty
pretty heavy. And me as a student at Sundance is in my little bungalow in the snow. And I'm writing all that. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. That, that's, that's deep. There's a lot of there, there. Well, I'm glad to know my work has such depth. I'm glad to know that the roots extend that far deep, but I never want to know about those roots again because I know they're there. And I don't want to tell a father-son story. I want to tell my gangster story. I want to tell my high story. The father-son story will take care of itself. The father-son story is for everybody else who invests in it. And the father-son story is there because it is deeper than just a robbery. But me, I want to deal with the robbery and let the other guy who's doing the writing, who knows about the roots, deal with the roots. Unbelievable. Most of the characters in the movie are given choices to make. And they make the choices that they make. And they pay the, and they pay the price or the, the consequences or they live to tell the tale uh, because of those choices. And we actually see it happen all three different times in the movie. And, uh, but actually, but it's, it's funny though, if you, if you just take that for what it is, if you just look at the case of John Travolta and Sam Jackson, it would suggest, well, okay, Sam Jackson made the good choice, made the right choice, and thus he prospers, and John Travolta pays no attention to it, and thus we know he dies. But you have to, but you have to think about Bruce Willis's choice that happens in this movie, because he actually makes two choices. One, he makes a choice to do a very unhonorable thing, you know. He actually makes the deal with Marcellus Wallace to throw the fight. He doesn't have to. Marcellus doesn't say, throw the fight or you're dead. <laughs> he makes it for money. And he takes the money and he screws Marcellus with it. Um, but he actually ends up living to tell the tale. Because right? he actually does make a moral choice later when he goes back to save Marcellus. But he's still starting from a very bad place. And he actually ends up prospering you know, for it. But again, he does, make a, you know, he does make a moral choice that he doesn't have to. Um, but if he had, now if he had left, that's, I'm just thinking about it now. If he had left the pawn shop and, and just let Marcellus be buggered, if he just left that, you know, would he still get out of town? You know, with uh, with Fabian, would he still make it to Tennessee? Would he still have all the money and everything like that? Now he'd be looking over his shoulder. Now, right now, he's not looking over his shoulder because he did the moral thing. He actually got away with it. When I write a character that doesn't have a lot, that uh, doesn't say a lot, doesn't get it across a lot in uh, in dialogue, and doesn't have that many story beats, you know, where, where these giant, you know, the, the, the giant reveals are happening. Uh, I tend to write those characters more prose-like. I tend to write them a little bit more like a novel, all right? Uh, uh, you know, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm putting a lot of stuff in there that you guys, the audience, is never going to see. And you're never supposed to see it, all right? But it's, it's there for the reader. You know, I, I want the person who's reading the script to have a good time and to be engaged in the story. And there's stuff for the reader that's meant for them, and, and, and it's not meant for you. And there's... Uh, 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 and, uh, but it's also, it's meant for the actor. And so it gives the actor like a sense of who this guy is. And more than most other scripts, like I said, I did a lot of exploring with this, but writing stuff that, uh, didn't, that doesn't even quite make the script. Like just to give you an idea, uh, like I wrote a whole prose chapter of exactly what happened on the boat. <laughs> with uh, I've written like like the first chapter of a book. All right, it was called Misadventure, <laughs> and there you find out exactly what happened. I'm not telling you guys, all right, but Brad knows, you know. Uh, uh, and I, you know, and it was all it was all it's all it was all done as it was all done as prose, and it was like a little chapter of a book, and he got a real sense of it. All right, in the case of uh, 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 describing. Rick Dalton's career, for example, and uh, like the career, the, his filmography, his situation that he had, the situation that he got to, the situation he has now. I wrote, I wrote that as not just like a chapter in a book, I wrote it like a chapter of a film book, <laughs> like a, a film book about Rick Dalton. It was called The Man Who Would Be McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and frankly, to tell you the truth, it was, it was when Leo read that is what finally pushed him over the edge to say yes. 
you know, uh, uh, to the character, because then he had a sense of it. And it was literally written as if, like, you know, uh, like Tim Lucas in uh, a Video Watchdog had written, like, a chapter on the career of Rick Dalton. <laughs> you don't have to know how to make a movie. If you truly love cinema with all your heart and with enough passion, you can't help but make a good movie. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to know a lens, you know, a 40 and a 50 and a fuck all that shit. Crossing the line, none of that shit's important. If you just truly love cinema with enough passion and you really love it, then you can't help but make a good movie. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We really dug deep to find you only the most valuable screenwriting piece of advice from Quentin Tarantino. And we found a lot of hidden gems from this screenwriting mastermind. So we made another video with an additional 5 screenwriting tips from Quentin Tarantino for our Patreon supporters. The link to our Patreon page is in the description below. Let us know in the comments from what screenwriter or film you want to learn screenwriting lessons in our future videos. Keep writing and see you in the next video.